So let's talk about the um, guidelines. We have great guidelines now, and we have guidelines from MASC, NCCN, ASCO, ESMO. They're all very similar. But let's talk first. Maybe you can explain a little bit about what we call highly emetogenic chemotherapy and the other categories and what that really means. Sure. Um, so it's, this has morphed over the years. So it used to be graded based off of levels. And so, so now our coin phrases, if you will, are HEC or highly emetogenic chemotherapy and MEC, moderately emetogenic chemotherapy. And highly emetogenic chemotherapy is uh, typically considered inducing nausea in greater than 90% of the population if you were to not give any prophylactic antiemetics. And I always, speaking of cisplatin, I always learned it and I always teach my residents and fellows and things that it's cisplatin. Like it will universally <laughs> cause nausea and vomiting, you know, even with very low doses. And that was one of the good things that the guidelines did a couple years ago is reclassify cisplatin instead of um, those lower doses kind of being the mech that, that now any dose of cisplatin is considered highly emetogenic. And so moderately amenogenic is that really difficult category for us that's a much broader, it's um, between 90 and 30 per, or 30 to 90 percent inducing emesis if you were not to give antiemetics. And so that's a really big range. And so I think that's one of our harder areas. And one of the nice things that this year we'll talk a little bit more about later is that they reclassified carboplatin and kind of jumped those higher AUCs into a highly emetogenic chemotherapy range versus the moderately emetogenic chemotherapy. So Beth, you give a lot of carboplatin, so what's your experience with carboplatin? I think my experience is 30 to 90 percent, so <laughs> it's very, this drug is difficult because some people do very well and other people do terribly with it and have a lot of nausea vomiting that lasts. Um, I typically think of carboplatin should be maybe day two, day three nausea, but some people get it for five days with carboplatin. Um, so this drug has been typically hard to predict, um, and I would say there's a good chunk of people that get a lot of nausea vomiting from it. So I think classifying it in the high category gives us the ability to pre-med appropriately. I, I have a little bit of a problem with the way the categories were laid out. 90% or more is highly metagenic. 89% is not. <laughs> now, you're going to tell me that we can find that difference, and it goes back to trying to define patients better. Who is more likely than not? Um, 30 to 90%, come on. It's, it's just so big a range that you know, I can't make you know, heads or tails out of it. And it's, you know, what we looked at in you know, full fox, for example, I said, oh, it's 40%. It really is 40%, you know, and we, we, you know, try and tease it out of the patient who needs help up front rather than waiting for them to come back cycle two where they've already had a bad experience. Um, so, I, you know, I, I appreciate why these regimens were stratified in this way. I'm not sure it's particularly helpful, and again, it leads people into believing something which may or may not be true on an individual basis. I think it's a really important point. These categories were the first attempt to try to make some sense out of something that we didn't know. And, and 25 years ago, they were yep. really excellent. And sure. they're still based, as, as you've all said, on not using antiemetics, which we never do anymore. And by trying to stratify them into very discrete groups, as you're talking about, really minimizes this continuum. Mm -hmm. And also things have changed in what we'll accept in oncology. So the, your point, as you were talking, is are we really going to accept 40%? Is that acceptable to have 40% CINV when we have drugs that could potentially reduce that? Even if you were at the low end sure. of MEC, you could make a good argument that you want to use the best regimen, prophylactic regimen for CINV right. as possible. I always say it's 100% in that patient. 100% in that patient. And even, even low is 10 to 30 percent, mm -hmm. and yet we're still accepting that. Now, not trying to make the point that we shouldn't use the guidelines. The guidelines are useful, but the way we think about um, supportive care is changing just the same way we think about what, you know, what a clinically uh, beneficial response is. You know, we, we've accepted higher criteria now, and we should accept less symptomatology, I think, in the future, and that's something that we, we should talk about. And Lee, these categories were initially set up by vomiting only, right? Um, which I think we're doing much better at controlling. It's the issue now is nausea mm -hmm. and how we're doing a better job of controlling nausea. Oh, for sure. When I talk to patients, yeah. you know, I try, I, and that's probably one of the biggest education points is separating nausea and vomiting. You know, usually when you vomit, you feel better. 
um, at least for a short period of time, it's that chronic nausea. And I mean, I even try to bring it home and give them a little bit of empathetic factor. You know, I was, I've been pregnant for about 20 months out of the past four years. And so I was nauseated 100% of that time. Yeah. And so I can empathize with them a little bit in feeling their pain and trying to help prevent and really giving them the best drugs we can up front. With carboplatinum now classified as highly emetic, how do we ensure that the electronic medical records that we use are updated to reflect this? Uh, Dawn, how are you doing this at your institution? So we conveniently uh, rolled out with electronic order entry of chemotherapy order sets just in the past couple weeks. Oh. So we're feeling the growing pains of such yeah. things right now. So we've been trying to proactively delineate those regimens where it, it hits most. And obviously carbotaxol is everywhere. So that's going to be a big one. But I think we need to, need to um, prioritize and really look at those order sets and proactively change out and add in those uh, the NK1 receptor antagonists where appropriate. I, I got I to say, I mean, practices differ yeah. in their EMRs. And EMRs differ on how they handle these things. And most practices let the EMR feed them the information. So you're dependent upon the EMR provider to update. Correct. Um, if you are, you have to ask them where they are. Uh, and typically there's priorities within their company and you're at their beholden. That being said, other practices take it in their own hands and can manage and revamp their own treatment regimens. Um, we do this when things come and change. It's up to us. We don't wait for our provider to say, yeah. we've updated it for you. We've updated it. Right. Uh, new drugs come out. We build the regimens immediately because our prescribers like to use it before it's available on the market sometimes. Um, so we have to build these kinds of things. So it's really incumbent upon the practice to ask the question, have you updated this or do it themselves? But it can be very difficult. We're looking at, you know, seven to 800 different order sets and you have to weed through which ones that it's appropriate to change, which ones that not. So it's, it's almost becoming a job in and of itself, updating electronic it order one, one, one sets. of our staff, it is their job to update the EMR. Yeah, Howard, you're exactly job. right. If they need somebody when, like us to tell them what to do. Right. When we did our last update, when we add, which was years ago, when we added palinocetron to the highly emetogenic regimens, I mean that we had to have someone from the EMR company come and do all of them. So this would be a huge undertaking, and this won't be as easy as just searching the word carboplatin because in lung cancer we have several regimens that are AUC of two, so those wouldn't fall into that. So you'd have to really tease out which are the higher doses of carboplatin and add that. And that, again, would be someone hired to update those for us. So it's, it's not been updated in ours yet, obviously. Yeah. It's, it would be a major overhaul. Mm -hmm. So it's worth pointing out that this change occurred uh, this year in the NCCN guidelines. In the Mask ESMO guidelines last year, it was also reclassified as highly emetogenic, and we're all in uh, varying phases of uh, implementing this. We have a care plan committee that does the same thing, has to sort through every, every single order set and make the changes, and we've done that as well over the last couple of months.